Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, we're here, of course, it's August the 27th, 2024, here on our Patreon channel. And I wanted to share a message with you guys that has really blessed my soul. I I have been, of course, I've been doing a lot of research after I was on the interview with Jennifer uh, and her husband made that comment about our minds being like a transmitter. We can both send signals and receive signals, almost like a radio, right? And it really had me doing a lot of thinking, and I really began to prayerfully do a lot of research on, on digging and and what an amazing message that's going to be when I do get to that, right? But in the meantime, I stumbled across an old passage from the book of Hebrews chapter, I believe it's chapter 14. We're going to go to it in just a little bit here. And that was the, the message about when Jesus was crucified. Paul's talking about that he was crucified outside the gate. And that we needed to go outside the camp. And that was an analogy that was used in the scripture that for years I have never been able to grasp it. I didn't fully understand what was Paul talking about. Well, I found out today as I was doing research in the Dead Sea Scrolls what that really means. Believe it or not, in the Dead Sea Scrolls of all places, right? But at the same time as I was thinking about it, just before I started to do this video, in my heart's mind, I remembered the vision that I saw Jesus years ago. Those of you that have been here for a while, you'll remember this that I shared with you. Um... And I call it a vision. It was a dream, but it was right at your waking hour where you're half asleep, half awake, and then when you have it, you come right out of it. It's, so to me, they're more like visions. And then <clears throat> the reality of it was so real. I was there on Golgotha. I was there when Jesus had been crucified. And it was getting late evening right before they took him off the cross. I could not see his face, but as I walked up to him, from about his waist down, I saw him. And I remember as I stepped and as I walked up to him there, I, my feet, I was barefooted. And I was walking through his blood. And it was kind of sticky, like it had coagulated, but it wasn't dry. But it, it was still fresh since he had not long passed. And I wrapped my arms around his waist, and I began to weep and cry. And I, and I thought, how could they have left him? How could they have left him on the cross? And I came out of the vision, and immediately I knew what the vision stood for. Many Christians leave Jesus on the cross. We haven't taken him down and brought him and embraced him within us so that we could be one with him. And this is what this message is about today. So I want to thank you for your support of this broadcast. I really sincerely thank you for being a part here with us on Patreon. Let me take you to where I discovered this today. I'm going to start here right with that very passage, but then we're going to back up a little bit. In Hebrews the 13th, sorry, it was the 13th, not 14th, 13th chapter. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 
Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. There, there is so much revelation in these words right here that it is beyond almost comprehension of the natural mind. And I, maybe like many of you, and what I'm about to say, there may, may be many of you that have already figured this out, and Brother Steve's a little bit behind, but if I am a little bit behind, then just be excited for me that I'm catching up. I would look at this and I would think, okay, so Jesus suffered without the gate, and I'm thinking without, like in other words, he didn't have a gate. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is that gate? And then he says here, Paul writes, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp. So what do I do? Leave my camp of friends behind? I mean, I, or, or the Jews behind? And then I didn't, then it really didn't make sense. We have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. But again, it says up here, though, that when they, the beast whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. All right, now some of you may have had the smarts to go back and you looked and you discover that when he talks about the beast, it's the, it's the ox that is offered for sin, that you know that from the scripture reading that they take the body and everything after it's been sacrificed on the altar and they take that beast outside of the temple and they burn it outside the temple. So that kind of makes more sense what the without the camp is. But in that case, we think that the camp is the temple. You know, a lot of times it's understanding what the verbiage of these words mean at the time that this was all going on. So the beautiful thing was, was when I ran across what was written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I want to give you an example. Before I go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me give you one example. I'm sitting there looking this up, right? Just out of curiosity. This was uh, patternsoftruth.org. And God bless them because I was about as confused as what they seem to be here uh, as well. So... And they write about that very scripture as well. And this says, regarding Hebrews 13, 13, why does it say outside the camp? It means outside the rest of Christendom. That's what it's saying. The context of the entire book or the immediate context seems to be leaving the Mosaic Judaistic system of worship. You know, that's not far from the truth, really just in the question itself and the way they're kind of speaking about. Answer, I agree that this seems like an off-the-wall reference. However, I think I can explain why some speakers use this in analogy. It would be good to start with the general principle of separation from evil. Okay, And then they go into the different things there about it. But in conclusion, they really, see right here, it says here, your house is left unto you desolate, the book of Hebrews was written to these. The apostles calls them, go to him, Jesus, outside the camp. The camp here clearly means the worship of Judaism. As your question suggests, they were being called to join the Christian company. And to some degree, that's exactly right. So it's a little bit around the corner to get to it. But what's beautiful and maybe before I show you this, I want you to think of one thing. Remember when Abraham was saying, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God? But he never found the city. He said he was looking for one. He said, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim in a strange land. But he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Why was he looking for the city? I never will forget. A brother I led to Christ about, oh gosh, let's see, 34 years ago. I led a brother, brother to Christ. His name was Jeff. 
And he caught the revelation of that. He said, you know why he was looking? He was only 18 years old, right? 18-year-old guy. And he's got the revelation already. And to this day, I still believe he was right on the money with it. He says, why was Abraham looking for a builder and city whose maker was God? He said he had met the king, Melchizedek. Melik Sadiq, the king of righteousness. Who served, he served to him the, the, the wine, the bread, the communion. He actually had a communion service with the king. He said he knew when he met the king, if he, if he had met the king of righteousness, then certainly he's a king, he has a domain. Where is his domain? Well, Christ, being in him, is the domain. We're going to get into all that. And it's actually even in Hebrews 13, believe it or not. Let's first go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, this can really get into some pretty gross stuff here, but it's what I want to show you. This is in column two from four, uh, cave four, 395. Uh, this is, let me just see if I can see real quick what I could tell you. The Oh, goodness, let's see. The, this is the Halakha uh, uh, letter. Okay, fragments uh, that were published from K4. All right, this is the Hebrew version of it. It is, and I have not even. I, let me just quickly. Uh, I what? Well, let me see first where I'm reading it here. We're in fragment three, line fifteen. So let's just jump over here real quick. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that we're actually seeing these things correctly here. All right, so what does it say here? <clears throat> we'll start with verse 13. The priest ought to keep watch over all these things so that they do not lead the people into sin. And concerning what is written, and there's a little blank space, outside the camp, a bull or sheep or a goat, for, blank spot, in the north of the camp, and we think that the temple is in the place of the tent of meeting. What that means right there is that the temple represented the tent of meeting like it was in the days when Moses was in the wilderness, okay? The, the tent where the, or the, what we would have called the tabernacle, the tent of meeting out in the wilderness journey was away from the actual camp itself. It wasn't inside the camp. It was away from the camp. That's the first thing to note, all right? <clears throat> and we think that the temple is the place of the tent of meeting. And Jerusalem, there we go, is the camp. And outside the camp is what? Outside of Jerusalem. So when he says that we are to go out, outside the camp all right now let's look at it let us go for there forth unto him without the camp in other words outside of jerusalem which clearly shows jesus was never crucified in the city now even the place there that the catholic church has there uh, there's two different places. You have the Golgotha, which is outside of the Damascus Gate, and then you have inside this, the old city, uh, we have the Holy Sepulchre, as it's called, where you have like three or four churches all around it. Where uh, I forget what the, I know the story about how they discovered this, and they claim archaeologically it was actually outside the city. All right. Now, if the Temple Mount is where the temple really sat, which that technically would be outside the camp. In other words, outside the city walls of Jerusalem on the Temple Mount was the temple. And Golgotha clearly was outside of even the temple and the city. Okay, all this really matters because, see, Jesus as, as the sacrificial lamb or in this case here, he represented the ox that was going to be sacrificed for the sins of the people was taken outside of the camp. And that's where it was burned. 
So wherefore also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. That literally means not like without, in other words, not like that he didn't have a gate. In other words, he was outside of the gate of not only the city, but the temple itself. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, without Jerusalem, bearing his reproach. Okay, this is where it's very important. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. You know how they always like to say Jerusalem is the eternal city? Everybody is looking to Jerusalem as this great holy place, the eternal city of God. But Paul just writes to you here, let us go forth therefore unto him, unto Christ. Where? Without the gate. In other words, out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Get out of Jerusalem. Get out of Judaism. That's why I say they're actually pretty close to the truth when they say getting out of Judaism. That's exactly right. If you're caught up in the law, you are in the camp. You are in the city. You are inside the gate. Jesus was crucified outside the gate, outside the camp, outside of Jerusalem. That's why it says, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, not sacrificial animals. But to do good, to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. What sacrifice? The sacrifice of the fruit of your lips. Okay, now, let me back up. It's going to get very beautiful. Mm, very beautiful. All right. Marriage is honorable in all, the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. And he had said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, what? The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Do you know what that is a reference of? Let's take a look. Genesis chapter 2. You remember what I shared with you a little while back? just a few days ago. And the, and the man gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. Ezer Kanegido. That can be translated, as I've said before, Kanegido, against him which is like an opposition to help bring him into the right order. It can also be like clasped up to him, but nonetheless, it is as ezer. And it's like I shared with you, you men that think that you have the authority over your wife because she's your wife, like she's some kind of prized possession. Because of this word, and then I show you over and over and over the word Ezer, applying to God Almighty Himself that He is your Ezer. If God is your Ezer, God is your help. And just for argument's sake, let's make sure we find this. I want to make sure everybody knows exactly that right there. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And let me so I make it faster. Which verse were we in? That's verse 20. All right. And let me make that a lot bigger for you guys. All right. Verse 20. Here we go. Uh, and help Ezad 
H5828 is the actual Hebrew word. H5828 is Ezad. All right. And we see that for the man, there it is right there. He's got a help, right? There was not found a help meet for him, verse 20. But then we get to Exodus Um, and it says in Exodus 18, 4, the very next time the word Ezer is used, right? And the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. God was his help. Wow. Uh, let's see here. Let me find you, uh, do, 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 do. here we go right here, Psalm thirty-three twenty. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, for he is our help, Ezad, and our shield. Um, Psalm 115, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord, he is their Ezad, help. And it goes on, right on down. All right. Many times it applies directly to God himself. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, Ezad. So God is the Ezad. And then, oddly enough, here we come and we read over here in Get back to it. Hebrews 13, verse 6. The Lord is my helper, my Ezad. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We're going to go back to Genesis just a moment. Remember them which have the rule over you, have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's almost like Hebrews 13.8 seems to be out of place. Why does it say Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever? Because when you read that the Lord is your helper, the word Lord, and in the Old Testament where I just showed you God is their helper, yod heh vav He. Do you know yod heh vav He is? It is, it will be, and it is forever. Or it was, it will be, and it is forever. That's, in that Four letters, yod heh vav heh, literally means I am that I am, or he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Lord is your helper. Jesus Christ was that same thing yesterday. He's that thing today when he came 2,000 years ago, and he will be that way forever. He will be that help, helper for that man. Be not carried about with divers strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Being that type and the shadow. But why did he suffer? Why did he go out there? And why are we to go? See, it says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him. Without the camp. Without Judaism, without Jerusalem, we have a continuing city. That continuing city is in Christ Jesus. So therefore, when we go back to Genesis chapter 2, and we see this 
woman is going to be the Ezer, right? The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. It's kind of like Israel. She's been in a deep sleep. She's blind, naked, and doesn't even know it. Kind of like the church is today. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. Isha, la isha, right here in blue, la isha. He made a woman. That is literally the word alaf shin, or the letters alaf shin mean the word fire, ish. And here he says he took her from Min Adam. That now he's literally talking about taking that woman from the literal dust flesh of that man. And he made a la isha. But that isha shows that the fire of God was inside of that woman. Didn't know that, did you? Veyaba. El Adam, and she and he brought her unto the man. All right, and then the man said, "This now is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was what taken out of man." See, it says taken out of man again. Up here it says he was taken from the man. Now it says she. Now he says she was taken out of man. But oddly enough, when God does it, he come. It was ta- that part. That part of woman that was made was taken from the Adam, that dust of the earth that he had made the clay figure. But when we get here, and we read what Adam says, Lazot ikha isha. For this she shall be called isha. Because he says what? Ki me ish. Now they translate the word man, but it clearly is totally having a different meaning now. Now he talks about because from from the ish and again you have the aleph sheen in there. Again, the, again the word fire but there's that yod right in the middle. Do you know even the rabbis know? They realize that that yod and that he together with the husband and the wife spells yah which means God. In other words, they say, if you take God out of the marriage, then it is broken. But there's still something missing, because why? When their separation came, the fall came, sin set in, they lost the Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus had to come and die outside the camp, outside the laws of Jew. Well, he died according to the law. They judged him according to their law, put him to death. But in order for us to get to him, we have to go outside the gate. You see, she was taken from the man. But we have to return to him And if you'll notice what it says, therefore, after it shows that she was taken from Ish, from that fire of the man. In other words, that was from the very spirit of God that was within inside that Adam. That's why she was called Isha. She had the spirit of God dwelling within her. That's why it says in Genesis chapter 3, from the very tree of life, he had breathed in Adam, that one clay figure, Chaim, the plural form of his own life. But we read in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Cleave. Back again to connect, to become one. And when you become one, what are you fulfilling then? You're actually fulfilling that passage in John right there. Where he says right up there, at the, well, let's see, I'm in the wrong spot, sorry. Back over here. Where he says up here, the Lord, and so that we, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. How does the Lord become your helper? 
when you become one with him. When you no longer twain, when he truly is the Ezer, Kanigido, the true helper within us, the Holy Spirit. See, Eve was only a type of that, is a type and a shadow. Okay? And so, therefore, we have to go without the gate in order to get there to find these things out. Also, you find in Exodus, see, the fat that is upon them and make them smoke upon the altar, but the flesh of the bullock and its skin is and its dung shall thou burn with fire without the camp. There it was. That's why they're talking about going out of the camp. Um, let's see here again. And if the whole congregation of Israel shall err... This is what I found interesting. This is another time when they're doing the sacrifice. After they, after they sacrifice the bullock, shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burnt it on wood with fire, where the ashes are poured out and shall it be burnt. And if the congregation of Israel shall err, the thing being hid from the eyes... Remember when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It was hid from their eyes. The assembly and of the assembly and do any of the things which the Lord hath commanded not to be done and are guilty. That's why that sin offering was made. But if Israel ever wakes up and opens her eyes, and will be willing to go outside the camp, outside of Jerusalem, quit looking as the physical Jerusalem, as your eternal city, but look to Christ, your true help, your true Ezer, and become one again with your husband, then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Notice what John says here in chapter 14. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, then show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. There's your Genesis right there. There is your, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. You're fixing to see the fulfillment of it right here. He left the father and he came down here to us. He left his mother. In other words, he was born of a virgin and he comes out leaving his mother. Now he's in a physical form. Verse 11, he says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I shall do, he, excuse me, I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whosoever you shall ask, what, excuse me, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now I pray the Father that he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall what? Be in you. There's the husband and wife becoming one again. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live. You, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Then will fulfill Genesis, the very prophecy. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be 
One flesh. One flesh. Imo, his father. Veishto, his wife. There's no plural in this. It's just his wife and Labashar for the flesh, Echad. It's uniting back what was separated in the beginning. No wonder why Philip wrote in his writing there. If the man and the woman ever reunite again, death will cease to be. He's talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. How do you get there? You've got to come outside that camp. You've got to let go of the carnal Jerusalem and cling to Christ. There's no other way. I'm Stephen Benoon. I trust this has been a blessing for you. Thank you for, for listening. Uh, just in, in the event that the video here ends up over on uh, our Israeli News Live channel, which it may eventually, I normally put these type of teachings eventually there. Uh, please remember to help support the work we do. Join here on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. You can donate here online. Uh, our website has been updated. Yana is going to be adding more things on there. You've also got LifeWave on here and EMP Shield as well. Either way, gives you all the directions and instructions of what to do. We thank you. God bless you. Have a blessed day in Jesus Christ. Amen.